Hi, it's good to see each of you here. Look forward to our time of worship together. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 337. Teach me thy way. 337. Certainly doesn't apply 
to anybody that's just a natural Jew. To think that way is to pervert the scriptures. Especially when we get to the New Testament and we read how the Lord Jesus Christ, when he instituted the Lord's table, he told them that this is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many. So when we read here in Jeremiah, even though in his day it was not so with the house of Israel, and nor would it be, the Lord through him is showing how national Israel had failed. Just like any that were put under the law failed, it was necessary. Even Adam, when he fell, it was necessary that Adam fall because Christ was already the appointed last Adam who was to come and fulfill all things. And so we see here God's purpose being revealed through Jeremiah because he says specifically in verse 32 that this covenant would be not according. So if you just think, well, he's going to restore the Jewish nation and he's going to put them back under the law. If he did that, it would be the same result. That's not what he's foretelling here. But he says in verse 33, this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. And he's talking about the house of Israel. The writer of the Hebrews describes it as that house over which God has made his son to be the head and the ruler. And that that house of Israel, the word Israel means prince with God. Christ is that Israel. He's God's Israel. And all those that he's purposed to save in Christ put back under the same circumstances. It's like some say, well, if I had been there in the garden, I wouldn't have done what Adam did. Well, yes, you would have. Or if we could just go back to the law and start over again. Some preachers like to try to take people and put them back under that old law again. You know what? It failed from the beginning and God purposed it. Lest any should put confidence in that. Here, the Lord says that he would put the law in their hearts to such a degree, as he says there in verse 33, not not a law written on tables of stone, but write it in their hearts. That's what the Lord does in conversion by the work of the Spirit. He takes and writes on the hearts of His people that obedience that the law required. Well, what was the obedience that the law required? Perfect obedience. Well, who has obeyed perfectly? None other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So, this new covenant does not do away with the law or just set it aside, but rather this is based on a law fulfilled. It's not our obedience, it's Christ's obedience. And so every requirement of that law, what the Spirit of God does is reveals it in the hearts of God's people, His true Israel. And because of that, it says there in verse 34 that it won't be necessary for every man to teach his neighbor or every man his brother saying, know the Lord. Why is that? Because the Lord reveals himself in his own through the gospel. For they shall know me. That's what true preaching is. It's a revelation of Christ and not a preaching of rules and regulations or a mixture, as we hear so often today, that really shows a lot of preachers don't believe in the grace of God because they feel like they've got to go back and add some conditions and rules and regulations to it. But in so doing, like Paul said, I don't frustrate the grace of God. That if righteousness come by law, in Galatians 2.21, then Christ is dead in vain. You make the death of Christ to be of none effect. And when he says here in verse 34, Again, this is Christ revealed in the inward parts. Him being the, the one who fulfilled the law on behalf of his people. Oh, what good news that is. Even as the Spirit of God 
was pleased to first open our eyes and we felt the weight and condemnation of our own sin, yet our eyes were turned to Christ. And when he says, I'll forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more, that's not something that the law can do or man's obedience to the law. That's the work of Christ. But where God no longer remembers the, the sin of those for whom Christ had paid the debt. So complete is the work of Christ in his death that there remained nothing but righteousness for God to impute then and there. That's where it all took place at the cross. And this is the new covenant which Christ said was in his blood in his death. It's not when you see it that this is accomplished or believe it when it's accomplished. No. It was accomplished at the cross and for that reason if it was accomplished for you or me then it was revealed. That's the being written. That's the law of grace written on the heart. Not a law of rules and regulations and do's and don'ts but grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in verses 35 to 37 we see here the Lord renewing his promise even with regard to the national seed of Israel. Here they're facing being taken away into judgment by the Babylonians. Jeremiah prophesying this time, but verse 35, Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divided the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. Here's a reminder that no, bad, no matter how bad things looked, in the light of all this condemnation, yet all of this was coming from the hand of him who is seated upon the throne. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, he's talking about the sun rising, the moon shining, stars, if there comes a day when those depart, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. Why does Israel as a nation exist today? Well, it's because God is faithful. He's promised, it's not conditioned on what they do, he's promised to preserve them so long as time exists. That's the only reason. It's not that there are still some unfulfilled prophecies to which we're to look and try to figure out signs and seasons and times. No. But this is God's faithfulness that in spite of their God-hating, even today, you go over to Israel, there's that God-hating that is in their hearts. Just like they said in Christ's day, we'll not have this man to reign over us. If you were to go over there and preach Jesus of Nazareth as being the Messiah, they would put you in prison. They'd arrest you. And yet God is merciful to what he has promised. Just like he says here, he'll never cast off that seed. And that's what Paul was referring to that when he said he knows that God has not cast off his people what that he foreknew he's not talking about all Jews but they're blinded for the most part but he acknowledges that were it not for God's grace he would not even know Christ that was his purpose so you can understand that in a national sense but also here's a promise to those that are the true Israel that he'll never cast them off They'll never cease from being a nation before God because God has purposed to save them and has saved them through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's His true Israel of which Paul wrote there in Romans 9. They are not all Israel that are of Israel. Don't think somehow that national Israel is God's favored son. No, there's the Israel within the Israel those that God has given to his son, the true Israel. But it would be more conceivable to think of the moon not shining and the sun 
not rising and for God to cast off anyone that he's purposed to save. And so it comes back now after prophesying what was to come in those days where Jeremiah now is speaking to his generation when he says in verse 38, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the city shall be built to the Lord from the tower of Hananiel unto the gate of the corner. So here he's announcing that after the captivity, once the city was destroyed, the temple destroyed, in the days of Jeremiah, that the Lord would again restore, rebuild that city. Why? Because it was purpose that Christ should come into that city. And that all of the law, the sacrifices that all pertain to that temple rebuilt would be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. The measuring line, it says there, shall yet go forth over against it upon the hill Garib, and shall compass about to Goath. And the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes and all the fields unto the brook of Kidron, unto the corner of the horse gate towards the east, shall be holy unto the Lord. It shall not be plucked up nor thrown down any more forever. So here he's describing how he's going to bring back and rebuild that city, the tower of Hananiel that's mentioned there in verse 38. That was in the northeast corner of the city of Jerusalem, the corner gate, and uh, probably referred to one of the, the corners of the city wall at that time. The sites of Gareb, when it mentions there in verse 39, and Gora. We don't know anything about that that we can find, but it does speak of how far God would extend the boundary of Jerusalem on the west side. And we're studying in Ezra right now and getting beginning into Nehemiah and seeing how all this was fulfilled. But I believe that even as here he's describing this physical city of Jerusalem, we know that it was plucked down and destroyed when the Romans came and destroyed in 70 AD. So some might look at that and say, well, God didn't fulfill his promise. But here again, in the broader context, the prophecy here would have to be spiritual as it applies to the heavenly Jerusalem. Because when he says, it shall be holy unto the Lord. Well, how is it holy unto the Lord? In Christ's coming and fulfilling all that that city and that temple represented to a, a point where Paul declares that the true Jerusalem is, is not that which is on the earth, but the heavenly Jerusalem. He wrote that to the Galatians. And that's how I can see this referring to the fact that that Jerusalem, yes, the physical had to be rebuilt, but that Jerusalem was holy unto the Lord. Why? because it was declared to be holy and righteous through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that that true Jerusalem, that heavenly Jerusalem, can never be plucked up or thrown down anymore. The types and pictures and prophecies and promises have been fulfilled. And it's only in Christ that we can see and understand this, the, the, the great fulfillment of what's being declared here. So a message of hope, even in the face of all that the Lord had pronounced by way of condemnation. He's a God of salvation, but he's also a God of condemnation. Gracious Father, thank you for your word. Pray that you'd give us always discernment in reading it, understanding that this is a spiritual book and it pertains to a spiritual people that you've chosen from eternity by your grace and 
in the Old Testament given all the types and pictures and prophecies and yet coming in the New Testament seeing the fulfillment in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, to be of that city, to be of that people, of that Israel, of which Christ is the head and who is the righteousness of that people that you've purposed to save. Pray that you would bless our meeting and our study in your word. This time we worship to your honor and glory and give you the praise and glory in the precious name of your Son. Amen. All right, let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 340. Nearer, still nearer. 340. Last time for mercy 
but not without sacrifice. And we see how the effect of his prayer brought the purpose result. That's what effectual prayer is. It's not anything I do magically, like some people say to me sometime, would you please remember me in prayer because I believe as a man of God, you have God's ear. Well, no, I don't have God's ear. His son does. And all I know is whatever is asked in the son's name, and that doesn't mean just putting in Jesus' name, we pray amen at the end. But whatever is asked of the honor and glory of, son, of the son, that's what people don't understand. There's only one person that God has ever purposed to honor and glorify, and that's his son. And any prayers that are answered are always for his glory. We selfishly and blindly think that somehow this world turns around us, that God's up there with all of this gift basket of prayers, and if we'll just get the requests up to him, he'll reach in there and he'll give it if we're sincere enough and do enough and be enough. And that's not, nothing but idolatry. Here, again, as we've been studying Ezra, is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look how simply this is put here. It says, now when Ezra had prayed, we don't find him like the prophets of Baal up dancing around and trying to plead and get some sort of response. But when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down what? Before the house of God. Remember the temple at this point had been rebuilt. And so now these sacrifices, that's what this priesthood was all about. Offering up these sacrifices before the Father. They're assembled unto him out of Israel. Notice it doesn't even say all of Israel assembled unto him. But they're assembled unto him out of Israel, a very great congregation. Like Paul said, they're not all Israel that are Israel. There were many that the Lord brought back from captivity that settled in the land and continued on in their own natural ways because they'd never been taught of the Spirit of Christ. But here, the effect of Ezra praying on their behalf, that's what Christ does with his people, that it caused these to be assembled unto him out of Israel, a very great congregation of men and women and children. For the people wept very sore. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Now therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born of them according to the counsel of my Lord and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God. Where are the trembling sinners? This too is an effect of intercession where God is pleased to bless, and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for this matter belongeth unto thee. We also will be with thee, be of good courage, and do it. Then arose Ezra, and made the chief priests, the Levites, and all Israel to swear that they should do according to this word, and they swear. Then Ezra rose up from before the house of God, and went into the chamber of Johanan, the son of Elashib. And when he came thither, he did eat no bread nor drink water, for he mourned because of the transgression of them that had been carried away. And they made proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem unto all the children of the captivity that they should gather themselves together unto Jerusalem, and that whosoever would not come within three days according to the counsel of the princes and the elders. All his substance should be forfeited and himself separated from the congregation of those that had been carried away. This is quite a story, narrative that we read here about how God 
when he's pleased to do his work, there's none that can remain indifferent. And there's always a divide, just like we see here. Those that God purposes to draw to himself, even though sinners, but that through the mediation of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and all others, like it says here, separated from the congregation of those that have been carried away. In other words, cut off. Now, I'll be the first to admit when it comes to this matter of prayer, and that's, if we're honest before the Lord, and I trust we are, we don't know how to pray as we ought. In fact, over in Romans chapter 8 and verse 26, just wanted to show you a couple of these scripture texts. I'm not preaching on this because I've got a handle on it. Just the opposite. I'm a sinner in constant need of Christ's intercession on my behalf. We've all seen those books written by different authors and preachers that feel like they've got a handle on this. And uh, they're more than willing to try to teach you, but also more than willing to take your money too. They'll give you lessons on how to pray and then tell you but to support this ministry you're gonna to have to send us some money that's not how God does his work but here's the first thing that I know concerning prayer and that is we know not how to pray as we ought it says likewise the spirit also helped our infirmities for we know not what we should pray for as we ought you ever find somebody that thinks they got a handle on it you can tell for sure, right there, they don't know the Lord. The Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The second thing I know concerning prayer, and that's what we read over here in James chapter 4, and verses 2 and 3, is that we ask and receive not because we ask amiss. And prayer is not for our own personal gain. It's always for God's glory. So any type of so-called prayer that is not for the glory of God alone is not prayer. It's nothing different than that Pharisee who prayed within himself. Doesn't even say that he prayed unto God. Thanking God that he wasn't like that publican or others. And this is clear in Scripture. James chapter 4 says, Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. So it's talking about those that rather than pray, they take up the arm of the flesh and attempt by their lusting and their desires and their killing and their warring to accomplish the will of God, the purpose of God. And so ye ask not, but then he addresses others that ask. They say, oh, well, now, wait a minute. We need to ask God's blessing. And many times it's asking his blessing to what you've already determined you want him to do. That's not prayer. It says, ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. That's not prayer. Here where we see Ezra in prayer, he was praying for God's glory. In that we see a type of Lord Jesus Christ. He did not pray for anything pertaining to himself, but that the glory of the Father. He said that in John 17. He prayed that the Father should glorify himself with the glory that he had with the Father before the world began. And thirdly, with regard to prayer, and that's what I love about the simplicity here in the Ezra 10, it just says, now when Ezra had prayed, we know that it's not by multiplying words in vain repetition. Next time someone wants you to go to some sort of all-night prayer meeting, so-called, and you're going to spend the whole night in prayer, what are we going to ask? What's the whole purpose for that? What would be the purpose? Here in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7, even beginning with verse 6, our Lord warns against such practice. 
But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. I know there's some congregations that call their midweek service a prayer meeting. And everybody shows up and they'll read a little scripture and then people start giving their prayer requests. And then they have these little circles where the circle can't be broken. You've got to keep it going for the hour. So this one starts the prayer and then the next one picks up on it and continues it and then goes on with the next. And so then when time's up, then whoever's leading it says, okay, when he sums it up, then it's done. That's nothing more than multiplying vain words. There's some that even will break up the men, go in their corner to pray, and the women in the corner, children in another corner. Here it says, specifically, this matter of prayer, you know, I, I have some that criticize us. They say, well, I never see your congregation praying. Well, why would you? Because the Lord says that we have a matter, take it to the Lord, that it be done in secret. Yes, we have those that we open the meeting and lead in prayer and ask for God's blessing, but it's not going to be like these others practice. Again, like the prophets of Baal to feel that the more they exercise themselves and afflict themselves, that somehow they're getting God's ear. Here it says in verse 7, when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, the pagans. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Verse 8, Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask Him. And I think I hear some saying, well then why even pray? He already knows what He's determined. Well, you read on. After this manner, therefore pray, Ye our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's the reason that the Lord gives his children a cry, it's to the glory of the Father. Whatever your will is, and that's what's next. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. The next part is, is nothing but contentment. Give us this day our daily bread. What's our daily bread that we need more than Christ our bread? And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. How is it that he causes us to be compassionate toward others? It's knowing how he's been merciful to us as sinners. All of this is in humility. Lead us not into temptation. What temptation? Well, the temptation of taking the matters into our own hands or thinking somehow by the arm of our flesh that we're going to accomplish the will of God. No. Deliver us from evil. That's not just talking about evil out there in the world. Deliver us from the evil of this flesh. Our greatest enemy lies within. You've seen the title of that movie, Sleeping with the Enemy. Well, that's what we do every night when we go to bed. We're sleeping with the enemy. It's in our flesh. And notice how it's summed up. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So this is how we're instructed to pray. And on the other hand, we do have the declaration of Scripture and that's why the title of this particular message is The Effectual Prayer. What is an effectual prayer? Over in James chapter 5 and verse 16, it says specifically here, confess your faults one to another. And I don't think that means that everything that is in my heart now I'm going to expose to you. And then in turn, everything in your heart you're going to expose to me. We all have enough trash in our own hearts that we don't need to be dumping in someone else's heart. I believe here the sense is confess your fault. Confess who you are one to another as being nothing but sinners. And if, if God were to deal with us according to our iniquity, who could stand? It's like the psalmist says in Psalm 130. But pray for one another. Pray one for another. How is it we pray one for another? Knowing ourselves to be weak. Knowing ourselves to be in need of Christ at every moment. We come before His throne of grace to find grace to help in time of need. Well, that's all the time. But it says here, 
that ye may be healed. There's times when the Lord does bring sickness and affliction to different ones. It's not out of punishment. It's his chasing. Whom the Lord loves, he chases. And it's in those times that we're reminded we're nothing but sinners, but Christ is all. Now here's the part where a lot of people get confused when it says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. Man is an italic, but it is in the singular. It's not speaking of the effectual fervent prayer of righteous people. If we can just find the righteous people and get them to pray, then somehow they're going to have God's ear. Now here I believe the sense is, how is it that when we confess our faults and pray one for another, that we can find healing? It's in the one righteous one whose effectual prayers are on behalf of his people, and that's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. I know it mentions Elijah here, that was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, it rained not on earth in the space of three years and six months. But what was Elijah but a type of Christ? And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. So even as we pray for one another, and we pray for the Lord's direction in all things, it wasn't that Elijah was any more special than anybody else, but it was the authority that the Lord gave him. In that place is, is one of his prophets. And we know the prophets, priests, and kings were all types of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so who is the righteous one whose prayer is effectual? Well, it pertains to the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And if any of us are considered to be a righteous one, it's only in that imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's the only reason God ever hears any prayer of mine or yours, it's going to be granted only through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and what God has purposed to do through His Son. Those are important reminders. So come back here to my text. Now and see how Ezra, as a type of Christ, his prayer was effectual. Not because he prayed in any special way that somehow we're going to learn now Remember back in the day when they had Jabez's prayer was going around and if you just had this little booklet and you prayed this prayer that you're going to see all kinds of wonderful things. That's idolatry. First thing about an effectual prayer, if we can just characterize this here. What is an effectual prayer? That was a question I asked at the beginning. Well, it's one that brings effectual acknowledgement of sin and who we are. It's not boasting ourselves before holy God, just the opposite. Like the publican that beat his breast and dared not even look heavenward, but said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And what did Christ say? That man went down to his house justified rather than the Pharisee. Justified before God as being one for whom Christ would pay his sin debt. And so even here while Ezra was praying, it says, that he was confessing. So it wasn't some sort of power in Ezra's words in how he was praying, but rather the purpose results because it's the Lord. Remember, none can pray apart from the Spirit of God, so it was the Lord himself directing this prayer to that end whereby God would be merciful. We have the words recorded in his prayer. We saw that already in Ezra chapter 9, verses 6 through 15. If you go back, when it, when it said, well, what was he praying? We saw that. It says, and said, oh my God, I'm ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespasses grown up into the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day. And for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered in the hand of kings of the lands to the sword, to captivity, and to a spoil, and to confusion of face as it is this day. 
So he's not skirting around God's holiness and justice. That has to be answered. And now for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape. Remember, we saw this last time. And to give us a nail in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. So here we see him, as it says, weeping, verse 10, and casting himself down before the house of God on behalf of this people. I see in this an example of our Lord Jesus Christ. He had no sin of his own to confess. But in his prayer, we know that from reading Psalm 22, that the Lord owned the sin of his people as his own. The sin was laid to his charge. And therefore in his prayer, by imputation, he was confessing that sin to the Father as his own, one with the people for whom he was praying. If you look over in Psalm 22, this is where some have missed the mark today grievously because they read these portions of Scripture and they're saying that when Christ came as a representative of sinners that he was actually made a sinner himself. And they say in verse 6, for example, in Psalm 22, we know this is Christ's prayer because verses 1 and 2 is what he cried. My God, my God. That word why is not questioning God. It's, it's the word wherefore. For what purpose hast thou forsaken me? Forsaken him how? God didn't turn his back on his son. But God put him on the cross and would not take him off that cross until the work was finished, accomplished. And so his cry was, Why art thou so far from helping me? In other words, wherefore, for what purpose art thou so far from helping me? And from the, the words of my roaring, to what purpose? Verse 3, Thou art holy. That's why God put his son on the cross. He spared not his son, but delivered him up. And so, this represents the prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when he declared in verse 6, I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. This is Christ identifying with sin sinners. He was numbered amongst the transgressors. What is man but a worm? How was he by imputation a worm? That when he went to the cross, that sin was laid on him. It was not put in him, but laid on him. And therefore, when he cries unto his Father, he's crying unto the Father as one with that people, those sinners, just like we see Ezra here, bowing down before the house of God, when it says here in verse 1, coming back to Ezra 10, casting himself down before the house of God, that word casting literally implies that he kept throwing himself down on the ground. Such was his, the weight of his praying before the Father as the representative for this people identifying with them as sinners, casting himself down on the ground, which is representative of what sin is. It's a casting down. Over in Luke chapter 22, and verses 39 to 46, I can't preach this portion of Scripture by pointing us to Ezra. He was but a man, just like Elijah, but... Pointing us to the Lord Jesus Christ. How is it that Christ interceded on behalf of His people? And if we're one of those for whom He interceded, then we can see just to what degree He entered in. Though the Son of God yet learned He obedience and the things that He what? Suffered. Here in Luke 22, and this is why I could never put myself in Christ's place and say, well, this is how I pray effectually. No, if it weren't for his intercession, I would have no hope, neither would you. 
in verses 39 to 46 here, this whole portion. When he came out, and uh, this was after Peter had denied him, and he came out from the judgment hall, he said uh, there in verse 39, he came out and went as he was wont. In other words, as was his habit. To the Mount of Olives and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at that place, at the place he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. This I know that left to us we could never know how to pray. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed. We see Christ in his humiliation here. The Son of God, creator of all things, and yet as a man, humbling himself, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me, nevertheless not my will, but thine be done. Boy, a lot of commentary has been said about that. This was not Christ shirking from the cross in any way. The word if is in this sense that even if it were possible that this cup be removed, from me, he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He wasn't looking to be removed from under this burden that the Father had given him to bear. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Here he was as a man, as if he were not God. He had to represent those sinners that the Father had given him. To such a degree was his weakening in the flesh. The weight of him, the just one, being declared to be the representative of, of his people, bearing their sin, that an angel came and strengthened him. Hebrews said that the angels are sent as to, to, for the heirs of salvation. Here's the, the heir of salvation. But it says in verse 44, And being in, in agony, he prayed more earnestly. You say, well, what was he praying? He was praying for those that the Father had given him. And the weight of what it was for him to go to the cross on their behalf it says, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Some people describe that as some medical condition that under the weight and strain that the actual blood came through his pores. Here it says, as it were great drops of blood. Either way, it's describing the agony of what it was for him to bear the sin of his people. And when he arose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow and said unto them, Why sleep ye rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. But here we see Ezra back here as a type and picture of our Lord Jesus Christ and his intercession, casting himself down to the ground. And again, his intercession being effectual because that's what God purposed. It says here back in my text in Ezra 10, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. This is not just some emotion that is stirred up in the people, but I believe this shows that the people were so struck by the weight of their own sin that they could do nothing but weep. And they sorrowed over it, knowing uh, and taking the blame themselves. Here's where I see Christ's prayers as always being effectual and bringing to repentance those for whom he intercedes. Think about Peter. Denied the Lord. How is he any different than Judas? They both denied the Lord. And yet, when Christ came out of the judgment hall, we didn't read that there. First Peter said he'd never deny him, and then he did, exactly as the Lord said. When Christ came out of the 
judgment hall, the look. That's all it took. He looked upon Peter. What does it say? Peter wept. Acknowledging himself to be that sinner. I think about the thief on the cross. These are just some examples of the effectual prayer of our Savior. That for a while he mocked just like the other thief did. And yet, when the Spirit of Christ, who was there present on that cross, dealt mightily in that thief's heart, that he told the other thief, we do not well. We deserve this condemnation, but this man has done nothing. He looked and saw in Christ that substitute and cried unto him. We sing that hymn that Augustus Toplady wrote, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. It's not the weeping that brings deliverance. It's the weeping that comes from having been delivered. The acknowledgement of it. He wrote, Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone, is the word he uses. But even in that sense, there's nothing that could ever cover the sin or take it away. Thou must save, and thou alone. And so, I believe what we see here in this confession of sin is the effect of it's the result of that effectual prayer of that righteous one represented here in Ezra. And uh, so therefore it brings the confession of sin, the acknowledgement of it, and the weeping over it. Blessed are those that mourn, it says, for they shall see God. But secondly, and we'll close with this, effectual prayer brings effectual hope <laughs> even as the Shechaniah here that's mentioned he would have been one of the leading men who the Lord had raised up to identify with Ezra in that work that the Lord raised him up to do but even in Shechaniah we see a type and picture of the intercession of the Lord Jesus Christ and, the, and of the righteous one but you notice what he says there in verse 2. We have transgressed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. I'll tell you, that's the result of effectual prayer. And I think about the work of the Spirit in the heart of one of God's children. It begins with the weeping, but it ends with the rejoicing. If the Lord has ever shown you your sinfulness, not just this sin and that, but your sinfulness, I know this, it's, it's not to leave you there. It's to cause you to hope and rejoice in Christ the Redeemer. And so, in verse 3, he says, let us make a covenant with our God. Now, we're going to pick up with this next time here about this putting away of these wives. Because Israel had been forbidden, according to the law, to marry pagan wives. And yet, here they were. They had taken for themselves wives of those from the land. And the real sense here is identifying with them in their false worship and in their idolatry. When they were to be a separate people. And so we're going to look at that next time here of how the Lord directed these that they should put away their wives. You say, well, that's a conflict, isn't it? Because the Lord says not to divorce, and yet here he's saying to put these away. Well, I believe that this too is an evidence of the effectual prayer, and that is it brings those that the Lord has purpose to deliver, to renounce every false way. That's what this is about here. And I want to pick up again with this next time and see how all those that the Lord draws to himself effectually, there is that renouncing of every false way, even like Christ said, except if a man come to me and hate not his father and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, as his 
own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Where God works effectually in the hearts of sinners, there's a separating out. And uh, we'll pick up with that, Lord willing, the, the next time. But I pray that the Lord bless us to see that were it not for the intercession of the Lord Jesus Christ, there would be no hope for any of us. But in Christ, all hope for sinners. That's who He came to save, sinners. With that in mind, let's turn to hymn number 354 in our hymn books. And I know we've heard this sung popularly, but if you think about the words, what a friend we have in Jesus. He's a friend of sinners. And it's not a matter of us becoming friendly with Him, but rather that He, like Christ said to His disciples, I no longer call you servants, but friends. Abraham was called a friend with God. What that means is there's been reconciliation. And so what a friend we have in Jesus. We'll sing this and then we'll be dismissed.